Well, imagine with you, Will, that you're at home one day, and uh, you start to develop some severe abdominal pain. This is a picture of me, <laughs> more or less. The abdominal pain continues for a couple of days, and finally you check yourself into the hospital. The doctor runs a CT scan and suspects that you might have gallstones. So she inserts a flexible scope into your bile duct, removes gall the uh, gallstones, and you feel much better. You're discharged from the hospital. A few days later, you wake up in the middle of the night with severe chills and a fever. Uh, you're going into septic shock. So you check yourself back into the hospital, and they attempt to treat you with antibiotics. Unfortunately, the antibiotics don't work, and you end up in the intensive care unit for several weeks. You have a superbug. According to the Los Angeles Times, similar kinds of incidents occurred at UCLA hospitals last year eight times. They were traced to the use of scopes that had been cleaned to the standards that were recommended by the manufacturer, uh, but proved to be inadequate. And in fact, of those eight patients, three of them died. Superbugs are a major public health crisis right now. In fact, it has been estimated that antibiotic-resistant bacterial uh, infections kill as many as 50,000 people per year in U.S. and in Europe alone. Moreover, a report just appeared this month, commissioned by the U.K., that estimated without aggressive approaches to policy to address this problem, it could kill as many as 10 million people per year worldwide by 2050. That's one person every three seconds. What is the cause of superbugs? The major cause of antibiotic resistance is profligate use of antibiotics in animal feeds and most notably overprescription by healthcare providers. If you enter a healthcare clinic, this flu season for instance, you might have a cough, maybe a viral infection, bronchitis, a lot of patients want to be prescribed antibiotics. They want to get something for their effort and for their money going to a health clinic. Doctors knowing this oftentimes prescribe antibiotics even though they won't help the patient and in fact contribute to the evolution of these antibiotic resistant superbugs. This problem has caught the attention of the White House and in fact recently, last year, an action plan was drafted by the White House for addressing antibiotic resistance. The very first objective in that report was to reduce inappropriate antibiotic use by 50% by 2020. Major question is how? Now, there's some obvious ways of going about this. The first one, information. Provide information to healthcare providers. Let them know under what conditions antibiotic prescription is or is not called for. Unfortunately, this has been tried. It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is healthcare providers are well aware of the conditions in which they're called for or not called for. That's not the problem. So a second approach you might take is, well, let's bribe healthcare providers, provide financial incentives for them bringing down the rate of inappropriate antibiotic prescription. This also has been tried, and guess what? It rarely works, probably because the amount of incentives by necessity pale in comparison to the amount of money that healthcare providers are paid. So this doesn't work. You might be tempted to resort to uh, regulation, prohibit healthcare providers from prescribing antibiotics for non-bacterial infections. Unfortunately, this seems like a loser too, because health care providers are going to resist strenuously any attempts to curtail their freedom of choice to prescribe what they think is called for. And anyway, even if such regulations went into place, a lot of them would try and circumvent those regulations by just entering into the health record a bacterial infection when they don't really think uh, it is a bacterial infection. All three of these approaches, information, monetary incentives, and regulation, are predicated on a model of human behavior, including healthcare provider behavior, uh, that has prevailed for many years, it's the rational actor model, the assumption that healthcare providers are very adept at maximizing self-interest. They're members of a species that we might refer to as homo economicus, economic person, right? Economic man. Decades of research in behavioral sciences, however, recently have identified conditions, systematic and predictable conditions, under which we fall short of these Olympian standards of rationality. In fact, maybe a more representative picture of how we actually behave looks something like this. A species we might refer to as Homer economicus. Fortunately, 
this behavioral model of human behavior, this uh, behavioral model of people, actually opens up a whole new complementary set of tools that we can use to address public health challenges, such as antibiotic resistance. For instance, we know that information is important, but behavioral science tells us that the way in which information is framed or presented is critical and has a critical impact on people's decisions. We know that financial incentives are obviously useful and important, but we also know that we're social creatures who are given to social incentives. We want to be accepted by our group. We want to be approved of by others and so forth. Regulations are certainly useful, but there are more subtle ways of influencing people's behavior, nudging them to behave in ways that we want them to without resorting to such heavy-handed treatments by creating frictions that inhibit uh, undesirable behaviors or trying to facilitate actively the desired behaviors. I'd like to present to you some examples, some illustrations of each of these three approaches from research that I've done with an outstanding group of colleagues at USC, Harvard, Northwestern, and RAND. Let me begin with the first, framing and presentation, presentation effects. We approached a number of healthcare providers at Northwestern University hospitals and presented them with clinical vignettes that described patients coming in mostly with upper respiratory infections and other kinds of conditions in an outpatient context. And all we did was we manipulated the way in which we presented the list of options for them, the, the prescriptions that they could make to those patients. Some of those prescriptions were aggressive treatments. For instance, uh, prescription medications. Others were more benign. For instance, over-the-counter medications. All we did was manipulate the way in which we presented these options in the order sheet. For half of these healthcare providers, we presented the aggressive medications one by one and the benign ones grouped together. For half of them, we presented the aggressive ones grouped together and the benign ones one by one. Our hypothesis is that when you list an option one by one separately, it gives the appearance, the illusion, as if it's more popular and more appropriate. So our hypothesis was that the aggressive treatments would be more likely to be used when they're listed one by one and less likely to be used when they're grouped together. What did we find? Here you can see when they were listed individually, as on the left-hand side of my PowerPoint slide here, these healthcare providers on average prescribed the aggressive medications almost half the time. When they were grouped together, this subtle manipulation that didn't change information or options in any way, just a simple change in the visual representation, reduced the amount of aggressive prescription by 28%. So that's presentation effects. What about social incentives? Well, one powerful social incentive we all have is for our words and our deeds to coincide with one another. When we make a public commitment, we feel inter- and intrapersonal pressure to behave consistently with that public commitment. This principle of uh, commitment and consistency we applied in the following way. We approached healthcare providers and clinics in Southern California, and for half of them, randomly assigned, we asked them to place a poster in their waiting room that was written in both English and Spanish, and it attested to the commitment of those healthcare providers to be responsible antibiotic stewards. It also had a photograph and a signature from those healthcare providers. Another sample of healthcare clinics were matched in terms of their rate of inappropriate prescription at baseline, and there was no such poster. What was the effect of this intervention? In the control clinics with no poster, we found, similar to national standards, more than half the time that a patient entered with a non-bacterial infection, they were inappropriately prescribed antibiotics. What about when they had the poster in the clinic? This brought down inappropriate rate to below one-third. A very simple, cheap, and scalable social psychological intervention had a dramatic effect. Another social in, uh, intervention that uh, was presented in, uh, in our most recent study, uh, we uh, tried to engage the competitive juices of healthcare providers. Doctors are a competitive lot. They're used to succeeding at the top level throughout their education and training. We thought perhaps they'd be uh, very strongly motivated by a little bit of peer pressure. So what did we do? Over the course of the 18-month intervention, we sent them a single email once a month with a little bit of information on their prescribing. We gave them feedback on their rate of inappropriate antibiotic prescription for upper respiratory infections and the rate of the top performers in their region, the top decile, which was uh, usually around 0%. And we gave them feedback on whether or not they were a top performer. That's it. What happened? Well, I need to start with the control conditions that had no such intervention. And here in these clinics, mostly in the Boston area, some in Los Angeles, uh, people started off actually performing quite well. The inappropriate rate of prescription was only 25%. Interestingly, over the course of the 18-month intervention, the rate went down. 
perhaps because these uh, providers knew that they were being observed, and so it's what researchers call a Hawthorne effect. They started to be on their best behavior, probably because these clinics also had some other independent uh, efforts that they were taking to reduce an appropriate antibiotic prescription. But more to the point, the peer comparison condition started at a similar rate at baseline and went all the way down to less than 5%. We virtually extinguished inappropriate antibiotic uh, prescription by the end of those 18 months with a very simple email sent to the providers once a month. Finally, let's talk about nudges. Modifications in the choice architecture that subtly present frictions or facilitation for the kind of behavior that you want. What did we do here? We made a slight adjustment to the electronic health record system that disrupted the workflow in a subtle way. Whenever a healthcare provider wanted to prescribe antibiotics for a non-bacterial diagnosis, an alert popped up in the electronic health record system, reminding them that this wasn't necessarily called for and asking them to enter a brief justification into the patient record why they were doing so. Now, from an economic standpoint, this is a tiny transaction cost. It takes them a minute, two at the most. Nevertheless, this little friction, this disruption, the speed bump in their workflow we thought would, could potentially have a big effect on prescribing behavior. By causing them to shake loose of maybe their inattentiveness or their habit, by holding up a mirror to them in terms of their behavior, and so forth. What happened? Well, again, these clinics, these providers, had a baseline rate of about 25% inappropriate antibiotic prescription. With this intervention, we brought them all the way down to 5%, nearly extinguishing the bad behavior with a, just a simple modification to the health, electronic health record system. Well, I hope I've convinced you in these minutes of the power of applying behavioral interventions to making at least a dent in this incredibly important and frightening public health care crisis of the rise of these superbugs. But I'd like to go just a little bit further and assert that maybe these kinds of tools can be applied beyond antibiotics to other pu public health challenges. For instance, one of the sources of uh, escalation in health care costs is the bias that healthcare providers and patients have to uh, choose the branded drugs over equivalent, much cheaper uh, uh, generic drugs. An exciting experiment was just published by Malhotra and colleagues just this year in which they made a small change in the choice architecture. When a healthcare provider wanted to uh, prescribe a branded medication, in this case, Welbutrin, the healthcare record system automatically replaced that with a generic equivalent, although the healthcare provider had the opportunity to opt out of this automatic remapping. What effect did it have? In a single month, the rate of prescription of the generic alternatives, which are much cheaper, went from 40% to 96%. What about hand washing? There are two moments at which healthcare providers know they need to wash their hands in a hospital that's entering a patient encounter and exiting a patient encounter. Nevertheless, most hospitals have a compliance rate that's well below 50%. This is scary because hospital-borne infections are a major public health crisis. About w it's been estimated that about one uh, person out of 25 who's admitted to a hospital will end up getting a, a, an infection that they didn't come in with from the hospital. It leads to well over 700,000 infections in this country per year, and more than 70,000 people will die of those infections per year. This seems largely preventable. The good news is some interventions are just starting to come online that monitor behavior and provide feedback are uh, proving some success in uh, increasing the rate of compliance with hand washing and thereby bringing down the rate of hospital-borne infections. With the uh, advent of new technologies that allow us to automate this at scale in a cost-effective way, I think that we have a really good shot at bringing those numbers into compliance across the country very soon. And I might suggest we could uh, perhaps improve on this by taking another behavioral technique out of the playbook, uh, a little gentle social shaming for those who don't wash their hands, as uh, illustrated in this cartoon from Gary Larson. But there are other opportunities yet for the application of behavioral insights to solving public health problems. For instance, we can think about unnecessary treatments. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that 30% of healthcare costs are attributable to unnecessary treatments and tests. Behavioral interventions could indeed show promise in the coming years to address this. And perhaps most sobering are treatment errors. An article just came out this year asserting that we had been underestimating the rate of preventable medical mistakes. They're now uh, estimating that this could indeed be the third leading cause of death in America. 
the third leading cause of death, responsible for as many as 251,000 unnecessary deaths per year in this country. And it's my hope, and being an optimist, my belief, that in the years to come, in the not too distant future, behavioral insights will assist us in making a dent in those numbers and bringing them down. So much so that I hope that five or 10 years from now, if I were invited to give another one of these presentations, perhaps I'd be talking not just about addressing superbugs with behavioral insights, perhaps there are opportunities to address more generally a whole panoply of public health challenges using a combination, of course, of the traditional techniques and behavioral insights. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you.